Hey, Elizabeth. Hey, Tomas. Hi, Erica. Can you guys hear me? Good morning, Erica. Hey. Yes. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm just giving people a couple more minutes, maybe two minutes. Mm -hmm. Of course. Erica, I was trying to reach you because there was a, a grant proposal available, and uh, I was hoping that you would help us out. We needed to find somebody with an EIN who would apply for the to the letter of intent. And uh, the only the only person willing was in India. They don't have EINs in India, so she couldn't do it. So we'll have oh, to wait for the next funding round, which is I think in October. I didn't. How did you try to reach me? I didn't get it. Oh, I just looked for your name through the Hyperledger meeting. Uh, I I couldn't find your um, email address. Really? So okay. Hyperledger, Hyperledger members. I went through that whole list. Of Hyperledger members. Hmm. Yeah, I know that I I had signed up on our HC Sig directory, and my email my email might be old in there because it's when I used to work for IBM. So um, I know I'm in there, but I don't think I even know how to add myself to the directory. So I'll have to I'll have to do that. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Um, it was only about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It was for um, mentorships for the project I'm working on. Okay, and then what you needed someone with what type of experience? Oh, well, so right now uh, we've moved it into a, I moved it into a hackathon. I found one partner from Duke University. And um, now we need somebody in AI and in blockchain to do the back end because we were I, I did the HTML. She's going to do the JavaScript. We need somebody to do the back end. Yeah, I don't know that I could have helped you with that. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah, I don't really, I have a little bit of experience working with Watson, but it was mostly in the capacity of um, the database that I write for in healthcare because I'm a pharmacist, but I didn't do a lot of work with that and I haven't had any other, other real experience with it. Um, and I've done some blockchain projects, but I didn't work on anything technical or, um, yeah. Oh, okay. so I'm not, I'm not sure I could have helped you anyways, but thank you for thinking of me. Okay. Okay, so um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I, I claimed the host. I haven't hosted this meeting in a long time, and I haven't really been in the space um, much at all. So um, I'm taking over for Ray, Ray uh, for this meeting. He um, is on, he's doing some traveling and he's going on his honeymoon. So very exciting. And wow. I hope he has, yeah, I hope he has a great, great time. And I think I think he's going to be on his honeymoon when I host the tw the next meeting on, on the 24th or whatever day that is. So I um, hope he has a great time. And he did send me a couple agenda items and then I, I gathered some other ones. And um, but if anyone has anything to share, I'll just bring up the agenda here. Um, okay. Um, okay, can everyone see the agenda for today on the screen? Yes. yes. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, welcome to the Hyperledger and Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting. I'm Erica, I'm hosting for Ray. Um, I'm a pharmacist and I've done some work in the blockchain and healthcare space um, in the past. And uh, so I have been co-chair of this group for several years back when Mike McCoy was um, the chair. I was the co-chair, but um, as I said, I haven't really been in this space, so I'll um, I'll go through this the best I can. Uh, meetings are recorded, and we um, have a YouTube channel playlist, so we really appreciate it if people would subscribe and and um, if you ever miss the meeting, you can watch on that uh, that channel. Um, so if there's anybody new to the group, uh, if you please introduce yourself, um, I. And Suya, I'm not sure. I haven't seen. I, I haven't been to every meeting, so I'm not sure if you're new. Um, so if if you want to say a few words about yourself, that'd be great. Uh, hi, Erica. Hi, Elizabeth. Thomas. Uh, very good day. Uh, I suppose it is morning for you people, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> it is uh, seven thirty p.m. for me. Uh, I'm from uh, Bangalore, India. So I, uh, I'm Asuya Dres in a sense, is my full name. And I have uh, my startup named Greenworld Innovations Private Limited. It is, uh, we are working on, 
IoT with blockchain. That is a uh, goal. So like uh, both sides and uh, uh, for Hyperledger, scalability, that's it, research oriented also, we are going on and applications, uh, especially the clean and green tech we are into. Healthcare is also one of our domain. So like uh, I have been in uh, touch with Elizabeth, uh, probably like uh, this particular meeting I am attending the second time, I suppose. Other than that, the Monday's meeting I used to attend. Well, welcome. Thank you so much um, for sharing. And uh, yeah, what 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 does what does your company do using the blockchain? Uh, we develop um, applications like uh, for uh, in the energy side, in the healthcare side. Uh, like uh, we need the transparency, and like uh, many uh, the immutabilities. Uh, beauty of blockchain. And uh, when we work on the medical data, like, uh, see, uh, it will be useful for many parties. Oh, but, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, this is, we are still, it's, a, it's just a budding startup. So we are in the starting stage. So not all the projects are implemented. In ideation case, most of the projects, the one that is being implemented is currently uh, the energy side. So like energy sector, that full application we are developing currently, but the healthcare one is in line. So okay, next... wonderful, wonderful. That's very exciting. I wish the best of luck to you. Thank you. And thank you for attending. All right, um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, so consider posting your contact information in our HC SIG member directory. Um, that's where people can go and kind of network and figure out who else um, they'd like to contact um, and, and network through through that site. Um, and then real quick, um, we have the, I'm just gonna bring these up. Um, this is the uh, Linux antitrust policy. Um, and so that's that. And then you can read through that at your leisure. And then the antitrust site, which is basically saying anything that you say in this meeting, um, yeah, there's industry competitors and we conduct all our activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. Um, so anything that you say, you know, could be, could be shared. Um, all right, so um, does anyone have any announcements they'd like to share with the HCC community? Okay, um, and then we have a Hyperledger member job board. And then we, um, if you wanna make an announcement there or, or on our Discord channel or via our email listserv. And I think the email listserv is a great way to make any announcements or, or get, get yourself out there too, because it goes out to all the members. Um, the next is the groups to join. Um, so Ray, Ray had put together a bunch of Telegram groups and Discord groups and Slack groups that people might be interested in joining. Um, Health Unchained is a podcast that Ray does. Um, Blockchain for Science and Women in Web3. These are all great groups on Telegram that, that you can join. Um, and then on Discord, I know Discord can get a, li a little bit crazy. Um, I know that I'm, I have like... 12 different channels that I'm on, so I can't keep up with all of it. And one day I hope there's a better way for everyone to communicate, but um, we have a Hyperledger Discord group. Um, Distributed Health is a great one. Um, I've kind of been a part of that one since they started. Um, and there's a lot of people in Nashville, Nashville area on that site and Hashed Health is part of that. So there's, it's, there's not, there hasn't been a lot of updates lately, but it's a good place to go. Um, if you kind of want to put yourself out there, if you have a startup or you want to get more information, uh, Molecule, VitaDAO, um, SciDAO is one that I'm a part of. It's um, it's uh, using psych it's, they fund psychedelic research in in healthcare. It's an interesting one, and they're pretty active. And then DSI World, and then as far as Slack, if you have Slack, um, Research Hub is a good one to to join. Um, Okay, moving on to upcoming events. Uh, I want. I was hoping Wendy Charles would be here today, but she's not. There's a great webinar. Um, I'll just go to this link. It's actually today. It's at um, 11 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, and it's the ethical implications of blockchain 
tap with Wendy Charles. Um, oh, this is just the registration, but uh, yeah. So she, Wendy's an expert in like regulatory stuff and she's super, super knowledgeable. She actually teaches a course in Denver on blockchain um, for the university. And this would be a great webinar to attend if you have time to go today. They're gonna explore the ethical implications implications of using blockchain technology and how blockchain can be used for social good. Um, she's a great speaker. So uh, if you ever, or if you do have time to go today, I would highly recommend it and it's free. Um, okay. And then I put this one up here. There's a big conference going on in Denver, Psychedelic Science. Um, this is one of the biggest conferences in the world and all of the pioneers of um, using psychedelics for therapy and psychedelic assisted therapy will be here for a week. Doesn't really have much to do with Web3, but, um, you know, in connection with PsyDAO and things like that, there probably will be some, some of that going on. Um, a lot of it is just about how, to, um, how the current state of research is going. Um, helpful ideas on how to um, do uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, which is now legal in Colorado with psilocybin. So should be a really interesting conference. I don't think they're doing an online version, but um, I live in Denver, so I'm excited to be a part of it. And then Synbio Beta, I don't know what this is, so I'm gonna go to it. Uh, Ray had posted this synthetic biology industry conference, um, Oakland. Oh, you know, I think Ray went to this and this are actually already happened. So um, I forgot to take that off. So hope that was good, but that's in the past. Um, and then of course the Con V2X Global Blockchain and Health Healthcare Conference in New Orleans. This is a really big conference for blockchain and healthcare. I've actually been to it. Um, there's a lot of good speakers. Um, and it's it's part of the uh, blockchain in healthcare today puts it on and they're they're also a good resource if you're looking for articles um, uh, for the current literature and current research in blockchain and healthcare it's a great a great resource and this conference is, is is a great conference I went to it in Boston like three or four years ago and it's really all the big stakeholders in blockchain and healthcare are there and it's a great place to network so. Um, yeah, and I, I, they also have an online version of this conference, so um, you can always sign up for that if you can't make it in person. But yeah, this is probably the biggest one um, around for blockchain and healthcare, and that's coming up in uh, New Orleans in September. So um, I'd recommend that one as well. Okay, so we have kind of a short list of discussion topics for today. Um, Ray had sent some of these over and also um, I added a few and some of them have nothing to do with healthcare. Some of them do. So there's a mix. Um, and the first one is this one and we can, I've, I've only kind of skimmed over these, but this is Primon. This is a fertility app, find $200,000 for leaking customer health data. This is uh, definitely a, a concerning thing and a hot topic, especially with reproductive rights, um, this information getting leaked out. And really what I, I thought it was interesting here because um, they had they had agreed to only um, only share de-identified data, um, non-identified data, um, but but they ended up sharing uh, data that was ident identifiable, um, such as Wi-Fi network names and hardware IDs, and they shared it with two China-based data analytics companies. Um, so basically people could find out who was using a fertility app, which um, is not good, obviously. So um, yeah, this is, they're being fined. And I had never heard of this Primom app before, but um, I thought this was an interesting thing to share because there is so much debate around. Uh, I know in the US, we have very strict rules with the HIPAA on what constitutes de-identified data for personal health information, protected health information. So this, I thought this was interesting. Does anyone have any comments on this or uh, want to discuss anything with regard to this? Okay, we'll move on to the next next one. Um, I posted this one. I thought it was I thought it was an interesting reference. Um, so the World Economic Forum just posted a whole big thing on uh, regulation. And they, they, they talk about using a global approach and it, I'm not going to download the PDF it's pretty long, but um, it talks a lot about the challenges of, of creating like a complete global regulatory structure and not just focused on each country, 
Um, and it's a great, re I skimmed through it and it's a great read if you're interested in regulation and um, their take on, on a global approach to that. Does it say whether it applies to asset backed tokens or fiat, fix it again, treasury? I believe it does. I do believe they go through that. I only skimmed over it. Um, but yeah, you can take a look and see. Uh, they do talk about they do talk about that. They talk about like what tokens are considered securities and asset backed tokens and things like that in here. Um, but yeah, I haven't had a chance to to read it completely over yet. But as you can see, it's let's see. How do they define crypto? Hmm? How do they define crypto? Does it include dollar bills and things like that? I don't know. I haven't read the whole thing over. Um, okay, so. What do you think? Is this is this a regulatory body that with authority that you would respect? Yeah, I do. Um, the world the World Economic Forum for sure. They they're definitely looked at as a source of uh, unbiased good information, and they've post, they've set a lot of guidelines before that I that have been referenced by a lot of people, a lot of respected people in the community, and I think that they are a good a good reference. Yeah. So that's kind of why I put this out there because I thought it was a pretty big deal. Do you, did you find out who actually did the analysis and came up with the recommendations? Was it scientists or economists? Um, let's see, it's got the woman in here. So she's a data, pol data policy for blockchain center for fourth industrial revolution in, in India, World Economic Forum. She wrote this. Um, I don't know exactly what her background is, but it seems like she's more of like a blockchain specialist. And I don't know if there was other people um, within the group that contributed to this. Um, like I said, I, 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 mm -hmm. World Economic Forum. It has the word economic right in the middle. Right. Of it. I know. So I know. Can you yeah. trust it? What about World <laughs> Science Forum? If they came up with one, I'd be more interested. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Cryptocurrency is eh, an economic tool, but it's a scientific tool. Too. Yeah, uh, maybe Elizabeth, I can, you know, for my two cents here. So, you know, regarding the regulation of crypto assets and generally regulation about blockchain more broadly, uh, you know, there is actually quite some bodies working on it, uh, you know, so we do have um, in Hyperledger, we recently got joined by a uh, European Blockchain Association, and we have INADBA, which is the uh, International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications. Um, we have European Blockchain Service Infrastructures. These are uh, the two bodies, the two main bodies through which uh, European Commission interacts with blockchain community. Um, you know, and obviously we do have a lot of this uh, regulation, but you know, by its nature, the blockchain is. A global one, right? A global technology and uh, we, the interoperability between these, um, uh, you know, between different uh, pockets of this ecosystem is very important. And um, I think one of the biggest part about the regulation is that, you know, if you have, um, you know, obviously we have local regulations, right? But how do they interact with each other? So um, right now we do have a lot of people working on that, uh, but it would be difficult to say it's, you know, that we have right now one globally accepted um, uh, framework for regulating crypto assets, right? But a lot of work is being done. It's obviously very important because, you know, without it, how can we move forward, right? And trust the, the data, the assets and, and um, you know, get it, get more adoption globally. Just, just the thoughts on it. So thank, thank you. you for sharing this, Erica. It's, it's good to know that there's a new uh, regulation. I wasn't aware of uh, that or a proposal at least. Yeah, yeah. It seems just in reading through it, it seems mm -hmm. like it, it goes through a lot of basic stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and but I haven't. Oh, sorry. I keep losing my screen. Um, and it doesn't ahead. really solve those problems. It just brings them up. It seems like it. Yeah, it seems like it's sort of an overview. Um, but I do know that people look at their their stuff, and it's definitely um, you know considered a good source. But who know, I don't really know if they're tackling if they have any new ideas, like you said. Okay, but that's out there if you want to take a look. I haven't had a chance to really look at it. Um, the next thing um, that I, uh, I want to put a few words. Like in sure. uh, India chapter, we had women in blockchain, that is uh, 
uh, this last Saturday and the previous Saturday, like uh, uh, we conducted one uh, event. So this Saturday, mainly we focused on this regulations. It is, uh, there was a panel discussion, even I was part of that, uh, paving a uh, way for regulatory compliance in Web 3.0. So Web 3.0, if you take it, it is um, basis blockchain, right? So yeah. like revolving around blockchain. So it was uh, very good. And uh, there are many countries, actually, they are uh, working on the uh, regulations, right? And in uh, more than 10, 15 countries, it is exactly in place, not the cross-border one, but inside the country, like uh, for tokenization from... Uh, mm -hmm taxation to like that is uh, inside the jurisdiction it is happening but we want it uh, around the world like around mm -hmm. the globe both like uh, like hyperledger can work along with many people and create some uh, common uh, framework so we need some uh, open source people to uh, chip in right otherwise That's like it will be difficult. and like uh, regulations are much needed only when regulations are in place like uh, web 3.0 can also be like a reality yeah, thank you for sharing. That's so exciting. I'm glad that you're doing a women in blockchain and I agree that you know the regulations are kind of uh, siloed right now so it would be nice to have more of a global approach for sure. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so the next, the next one is not really related to healthcare either, but I thought this was interesting. Um, it was kind of all over the news. It was about how um, a group of leading technology experts have warned that artificial intelligence should be considered a societal risk and prioritized in the same class as pandemics and nuclear wars. Um, so yeah, this was, I heard about this on NPR and um, yeah, that's, it's interesting that they're coming, you know, some of the big people coming out um, that's created a lot of these things like Chat, Chat GPT, um, Google DeepMind have come out and um, said these things. And it is concerning. And I think that it's good that they're coming out and, and making these statements and, and treating it like, you know, as something, you know, that could have potential implications. There's a $100,000 prize for people. I think they, they have 20 of them. Uh, for anyone who comes up with the guardrails and safeguards necessary for AI to, to function, uh, they really want to get it out. And uh, that's a prize that I think it, it's worth noting that um, I don't know any human factors engineers who are actually writing up the guardrails and safeguards for AI. It's just sort of uh, one of those things that just getting out there as soon as like, getting it out there before it's finished product. Um, but I do, I do, because I'm a human factors engineer, I'd love to have been the one to work on that before it got out there. It's over. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, and I, yeah, it's crazy that there haven't been guardrails set up. And I'm glad that they have these, these, these prizes out there, because it's, it needs to be figured out for sure. Um, but it's a great assistive device for people with low IQ, just think. Um, you could actually, it, it's a real, uh, what do they call it, field, uh, it really evens the field, even the playing field for people with low IQ. They all, have, all they have to do is ask. They have all this intelligence now that they didn't have before. Um, it's, yeah. it, it's wonderful. And I, 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 I've never used it, but I do know that um, you know, I don't see it as a threat because I see all of these failure modes as being something that doesn't affect me. It affects maybe people who are younger or more co coercible, or it seems to be that, yeah, I see the failure effects. I see the failure modes and I, I would know how to prevent it from bothering me. Mm -hmm. But not everybody has that education and, and I wish they did. <laughs> A lot of people don't. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And for my work, I synthesize literature and, and analyze literature for uh, in healthcare publications for drugs to assign ratings for profitable uses. And um, they're saying a lot of the work that I do could be taken over a little bit by by chat GPT. Um, so it's interesting how many how many different things it'll it'll replace too. I'd say the main problem that it would have that might affect me is that it could whip up a mob against any one person. 
and oh, yeah. just manipulate by manipulating people. I hadn't thought about that, Elizabeth. That's a great point. <laughs> so yeah, even more um, need for some guardrails. That, that was actually an interesting one. It just reminded me now that Elizabeth mentioned it. Uh, I was reading that recently, you know, when you get this captcha and then if you want to go to a website that, and then you have to choose, I don't know what traffic lights or like, you know, be a proof that you're not a robot, right? And I think mm. that they, they did sort of a challenge for the AI if they can get around it. Uh, but you know what, what it did instead of uh, trying to sort of um, break uh, break through it, it actually just hired a person on Upwork or something like that, paid them sort of like promised them to pay if they will solve that for them. So basically, it manipulated that human to do it for it, and that's how it got into the into the website. Wow, that's yeah. clever, clever, clever. Yeah, that's very clever. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, I clever I and scary, <laughs> scary, very, yeah. very, very. You know, I have uh, a coercion checklist that's helped me. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'd be able to now start selling it because people would be concerned about being coerced. Before they never were. They always thought it's fun to be coerced by human beings. It's it's you know, trust is manipulated through touch and when somebody holds somebody's hand it increases their trust in them and suddenly they're trusting somebody who they really can't trust and it, it gets people to give money over and to give their life over and have their babies all kinds of things and nobody's ever thought about it until now <laughs> but i mean how, how much more has ai done that a human being hasn't done to manipulate people it's really no more it's no more dangerous than like a, you know, a, a clever manipulator. Right, but we just don't have control over it or it's just, it can go rogue. <laughs> but I think you should, I think you should come up with something because I think it would be useful and you could sell it. <laughs> um, okay, any more comments on this? Okay. Okay, so this also has nothing to do with healthcare, but big news in crypto um, with the SEC filing the complaint against Binance. Um, and then also, there, I guess today there was a class action suit too against Binance today um, for, for profiting off of stolen crypto funds. Um, so yeah, this was a big deal. I think it was on the 5th. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard about that because the market kind of crashed after this and then now it's back up again. But um, yeah, I thought it was funny. They, they talked about um, 13 charges uh, accusing the company of Mr. Zell of unlawfully soliciting investors and customers, misrepresenting the degree of trading on the platform and misleading the public about its oversight, um, all kinds of things. And then they, they talked about how he bought like a, a huge yacht with the money and um, they're seeking to ban Binance in the US and sent Bitcoin down more than 5%, which isn't that crazy. But um, yeah, I thought this was um, just big news. So I wanted to share it. Uh, any, yeah, I subsequently purchased an $11 million yacht. Um, any comments on this? All right, so the next two are about healthcare. Um, Ray had submitted this one. It's a really cool uh, summary of six mental health organizations in tech in the Web3, different things people are doing um, because it was Mental Health Awareness Month, I believe, last month. Um, so there's six in here. The first one is Mental Health uh, Collective, which is a nonprofit that provides free and accessible mental health support. Um, peer to peer support via Twitter spaces. Um, so it's just a community line for safe space within the web three. And all you have to do is sign up on their website and you get access to their discord. Um, and you can support by donating. Uh, so yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, not sure how they how they establish privacy with that. But um, yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> that's the main thing, right? Um, I I, I just, it just occurred to me this morning during this meeting that there was a murder um, and a man was found dead in somebody's private backyard. And it turns out that he was the, the person who um, had coded and put out there this app 
uh, for, for sobriety. And it's called Soberlink. That was the name of the app. And it was for all the people in, um, in, with the sobriety community to communicate with each other and mentor each other and, and help each other to, you know, like, hey, get on the app. I'm having trouble. Somebody's offering me a drink, you know, that kind of thing. Would you please help me um, be strong enough to tell them to get, get away from me? Um, that kind of thing, but then he was found dead. I was like, why? And it just occurred to me today, why? maybe it's because when he, he started using the app and start, people started being able to reach each other on web too, they felt uh, that their, their anonymity was a risk. And I'm wondering if these people might have the same problem with, in web three that he had with web two. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, it, it makes me wary of these these helpful you know um helpful sites or web three things that you can go to it just makes me wary it's a good it's i i i think that that could be a valid reason why that happened for sure um okay the next one is peace inside live um this is just this is having to do with the metaverse um curate inner joy and peace within your life uh it, this is something about maintaining a positive mindset as you're going through life and it looks like it's tied to the metaverse and here's the website um so i don't know exactly what this one's about but um it's called peace inside live uh the next one is healing hippies nfts uh this is a collection of 8888 unique nfts with the power to heal um, the holders of this project get, get access to live coaches and specialists to enhance their mind, body, and soul. Um, you, get, you get an aura that unlocks exclusive potion, portions in the app and access to the Hibbyverse. So yeah, here's another one that's kind of funny, kind of interesting. Um, so that's healing hippies. And then the fourth one is held mind. Um, they're found, okay, so they're actually founded by a licensed psychotherapist. Um, with a decade of experience, so that seems seems a little um, seems good in that way. Uh, so they have a basic understanding of Web three. Um, they partner with forty different brands to support their community health efforts. Um, so this one looks interesting. I might have to check it out. And then cool cookies. Um, this is I, what's up with the eight thousand eight hundred eighty eight? Does anyone know? I I've been out of the space for so long. I'm like this has got to be something because it's. I thought it was usually 10,000 that they do, but now it's 8888. Okay. I think, see, I think it's a human doctor's thing because I've, I've actually done this before. I do it with ones. So okay. um, each of my NFTs is worth 11,000 or 11, 11,111, you know, or $1 and 11 cents or $11 because it's easier to type it out. Hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, this is to spread awareness about mental health and you get access to an exclusive discord um, and they got a donation of $10,000. Wow. OK. Uh, this was in memory of the founder's brother who took his life. So, yeah, it looks like there's some history behind this one. Um, interesting name, Cool Cookies. And then the last one is Logout Center for Digital Wellbeing. Um, to create a balanced use of the space. Uh, oh, this is to teach people how to responsibly trade cryptocurrency, um, get access to online classes and more. So not really having to do with healthcare. Um, but I know there's a lot of a lot of tools out there like that that are trying to help people learn crypto. So this is another one. Digital well-being. All right. Any comments on these? All right. Just and then thanks the, for sharing. Can I check it out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check yeah. it out. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't have a ton of time to go through and and really look at what was going on in the space. So if anyone has anything they want to share with the news of blockchain and healthcare this week, please please uh, jump in at any time. Okay. The last one is um, Magic raises fifty two million in funding led by PayPal Ventures. Um, this is a wallet as a service provider, um, and they they raised a bunch of money. It's it's currently used in brands in retail, music, fashion, and gaming, um, including Mattel, Macy's, Exola, and Immutable. Um, I think that their main goal is to increase adoption, um, providing authentic digital ownership opportunities. 
um, and they plan to expand functionality, enhance use cases, and deepen integration within the European Union and Asia Pacific region. So I thought this was this doesn't have to do with healthcare. Ray actually shared this one. I think that um, this is really you know if this is really for real. It's gonna it's definitely gonna drive adoption if it's got ties to these brands. Um, so yeah, I think it was it's a lot of money, um, and it's PayPal, so it's a big deal. Any comments on this? So you'd be able to create your own wallet? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, and it looks like you'd be able to, you know, interact with some of these participating and use your crypto for some of these participating um, companies. Uh, yeah. Create wallets using existing email, social, or SMS. So they're making it easy to create a wallet, which is, I don't know, kind of scares me too, but uh, yeah. So all, all in one package for user onboarding, which includes the authentication, fiat on ramps, NFT minting, and NFT checkout. Um, any more comments on this one? All right, and then the last thing, which I haven't looked at at all, um, this might have been in last week's meeting too. It's from Nature, very technical. Um, it's a consultative transaction based blockchain cybersecurity model for health care systems. And I tried to read this and I was like, oh my gosh, this is very technical. But um, if you're interested, it's uh, just about cybersecurity. Um, it's a different technique uh, called consultative transaction key generation and management to enable secure data sharing in healthcare systems, generating a unique key pair based on random values with multiplicative operations and timestamps. And it's then stored in discrete blocks of hash values using blockchain methodology. So if you're interested in that and know a lot about cybersecurity, um, this is an educational article for you. Um, any comments on this? All right. Well, I don't have anything else. Does anybody have anything they want to share or discuss today? Yes, I'm putting it in the chat. Oh, let me check the chat. Okay. Okay, so first thing you shared, NIH toughens enforcement of delayed clinical trials reporting agency says it has bought more than 200 times. Do you want to talk about this one? I'll bring it up. Sure. So um, as we know, we're, what we're doing blockchain is going to solve problems for clinical trials. And one of them is the latency of pu publishing the information. Right now, if, uh, the longer the clinical trials um, in private investigator waits, the more they can capitalize on their investments. So they get the investor to invest money, then they charge $3,000 for each um, procedure in the clinical trial. And then, you know, 10 years later, they're still charging the $3,000 per procedure, even though they have the results of their initial uh, clinical trials that they could publish. And then that published uh, results could go to the scientists and doctors who create the standard of care. And then that particular clinical trial procedure could become standard of care, become covered by insurance and become free for most people. But meanwhile, they're still charging the $3,000 per procedure and giving that money over to their investors. So um, the, the, and I, uh, they decided to crack down, the authorities decided to crack down on this kind of scam and they're, um, they, they pulled 200, they didn't really pull their, their, um, their license to provide any future clinical trials. I don't know why, because it's a violation mm -hmm. of the regulations. And it, it is um, it is punishable by um, by some kind of a censor or some, there gotta be consequences to, to running this kind of scam. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've seen them. But with blockchain, what happens is that the, the patient provides the data, the patient owns the data when the patient puts the data on blockchain and makes it available that patient can now sell sell that her her uh, before and after data to anyone she pleases. She doesn't have to wait for the principal for the uh, principal investigator to decide that the investors are, have had enough profit and now they're going to publish their results. 
Right. It, it looks like in here it says that there's a one year deadline, but the median for tardiness was 400 days. And that only 37% met it. So yeah, I, I don't know how they're getting away with it. That's, yeah. I mean, you know, well, I, I've read what I've read is that the United States government is so corrupt, you're either a crook, a coward, or a whistleblower about <laughs> to lose your job. It's, you know, that's the cliche. Um, but it, it might have some, it actually has, um, it's been reported that there are very, I mean, the FDA, that whole, what the health, that whole mm -hmm. movie is about that. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's quite possible that there are enough, uh, enough, crooks and cowards in in the um nih that it's actually wasn't it the nih yeah it says nih has recently but wasn't steps. wasn't it the nih that was recently you got a whistleblower mm, i don't know there's see. so many whistleblower yeah i know i mean i used to work in the pharmaceutical industry so <laughs> i know all about the levels of corruption going on it's just sickening but yeah i'm not sure mm -hmm. Yeah, a woman testified that she left the air was the air force because of the corruption. Mm -hmm. so, mm. Okay, so I mean, I, but that's just you know you have to go to the judge's findings before you can really say whether. And everybody's corruptible. It's just a matter of do you have healthy influence in your life, and is that healthy influence uh, something that you choose over the corrupt influence? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, wow. And even down here, it says that um, informed, because this talks about how they're not even getting informed consent. So yeah, it looks like there's a lot of issues going on. I, I, I wasn't aware. I don't directly work with clinical trials, but yeah, I, it's crazy. And I think, yeah, if the patients own their own, you know, data around clinical trials, that could help a lot. Like you said, thanks, Elizabeth. Let and with blockchain, what... you wouldn't have to go through their files to find out if they had informed consent, it would all be mm -hmm. readily available. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, it would all be together and available and visible to everyone that needed to see it. Well, thanks for sharing, Elizabeth. Let me see what else we got in here. Um, I think you had one more thing. Okay. ERC 6551. Okay, I'll just pull this up. Okay, Elizabeth, do you want to talk about this one too? Um, sure. It's just a new token standard um, come out by, by that Ethereum's come out with. Um, these um, token bound accounts create a smart contract wallet that can do things like um, hold other wallets in it, create multiple on chain identities, NFTs, use them to interact with smart contracts and dApps without relying on a wallet. It's a uh, it's sort of a, it's a token bound account with wallets in it, if you like, um, allowing your various wallets to perform transactions with each other, whole token. It kind of makes a soul bound token obsolete, I think. What do you think? Mm. Mm. Yeah, this is interesting. I hadn't, I, I didn't know about the 6551. Yeah, definitely takes, yeah, seems like it's taking the capabilities of NFTs to another level. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I agree. Token bound accounts creates, I'm just reading it over. Um, yeah, that's very cool. Wow. So you can compose everything into a single ERC six five five one. I'll have to look and see how this like look more into technically how this works because I, I hadn't looked into it yet. Thank you so much for sharing. This is this is very cool. And then there's one more article. Um, this is oh, there? they found out. Yeah, I put it in the chat. They found out. Um, somebody did a, a sort of meta analysis of. Uh, open source coding in who is in healthcare or all of science, and they found that they just did the statistics. Um, pe most people chose to use GitHub. Most people chose the MIT license. Um, 
I don't see that. Is there a link to it? I, I don't see it in the chat. Oh, I was gonna... um, actually, I see... I'm not finished reading it, so I don't have the link to it yet. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Yeah, you can talk about it. That's that's great. I mean, it's still open in one of my. Uh, um, is it, it's just it, I I found it interesting that that people chose the MIT license, even though like the way um, Hyperledger does, even though that means that somebody else could capitalize on your open source code. And I kind of wanted to start a conversation about that. Okay. Any other comments on this? I don't. I don't know much about about this. Um, oh. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I haven't been so, in the space in a long time. You know, using Fletcher is one of these. Uh, using GitHub with um, the MIT license. So why I choose the CC by NC SOT. Like 4.0 license is um it's for non-commercial use only so you and you have to attribute everything that i do so it, you know you see you know when you're running your code and it's slowed down because some of the coders want funding well why did they make their code um mit or why didn't they make it cc by saucy you have to give attribution to them whenever you use it See, I wonder why why did Hyperledger choose the MIT license where anybody could um, isn't isn't the MIT license where anybody can use the code without giving attribution to the coder and mm -hmm. for commercial purposes? Yeah, I don't know. That doesn't seem that does seem odd that they would choose that. At first when I thought I mean, when I first met Linux decades ago, I thought everything was done on the Apache license, but um, I've been looking at the licenses now, so I'm just starting to notice the licenses and look at them, noticing mm. that both of them are MIT. And then I look at all the lists, you know, of all of the corporations that use Hyperledger's code. And uh, although like Kaleido is one of them, um, they do provide a free account for limited purposes so that, you know, it is kind of free. It's it's great, you know, in a way, okay, I I. I provided Kaleido with the code for free and now they're providing me with a limited account for free. No problem. But when they say, oh, but if you want more um, features, you have to pay. And wait a minute, I wrote the code. Why should I have to pay for it? See? So that's why mm. I, I wanted to start a uh, Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. It does not seem uh, like, I don't know why they went that way with it. But Elizabeth, I mean, Hyperledger is using the Apache 2 license. Oh, okay. Yeah. As I've, I have seen on some of the, uh, the GitHub repositories, the MIT license. Okay. Okay, I'll have to look into it. But as far as I'm aware, it was the Apache 2. And, you know, is it was a part of the, uh, you know, open source philosophy in general. Uh, but let me have a look at it just to make sure. Can I, and is that the one that Kaleido is using, for example? And, um, and is, uh, and what is the Apache 2 license to have with respect to attribution and commercial use? Um, that I don't know. Yeah, I haven't looked at the Apache license in years. I, it's probably updated. Okay. And okay. Back then, that but... was the first license I ever looked at. So, the, you know, Wikipedia uses CC by saw, right? So you, you can use it for any, anything you want as long as you give attribution. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. I'm not an attorney, but I'm, I'd like to know a little bit more about it. You know, you see all of consensus at Accenture, you see all the co companies using Hyperledger uh, right. code. And, and, and as far as you know, they're all under the Apache license. Mm hmm. So, um, what does that mean for the coders that they still have to beg for money through mm -hmm. slowing down your uh, your coding experience and telling you that this code needs funding? Have, has anyone else ever you, you're coding and all of a sudden this code needs funding and it slows you down and you're like, oh. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, why didn't they just demand funding in the first place? It's sort of like, you know, Whole Foods employees. Mm -hmm. 
You know, they should just demand more money. You know, your boss is making billions of dollars. Why don't you demand more money? Then you won't have to wait, won't have to compete against the homeless people for the free food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The people just do what they're told. But Erica, you're actually making a fun. How did you, uh, it's kind of personal. I shouldn't bring it up, but I mean, there's got to be a way to ask Hyperledger for funding if if you're doing the coding, right? Yeah, I don't, I I don't know. I've never done coding for Hyperledger, but um, and I don't, I, yeah, no, I've no, I've taken some courses, but I've never actually, no. But I mean, if you even if you do the documentation for Hyperledger, there's got to be mm -hmm. ways to to demand the funding and and. It seems to me as though we demand the funding, we apply for the mentorships, we apply for stipends, and when we don't get them, we still keep coming, we still keep contributing. And mm -hmm. why do we do that? Is that yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's such a purely volunteer situation. Um, yeah. It's well, hard I mean, to keep. Go ahead. Oh, it's hard to keep those types of things up, you know, when you're not getting compensated. You, you wonder about the quality of the work, and I go to a lot mm -hmm. of meetings where people are just basically spouting their own opinions without anything backing it up. There's no quality control. Right. Yeah, it's a hard, it's hard. Yeah, I'm not sure what it looks like to get funding, and but I do think there should be options for that. I, th I, I was one, I thought you were one of the people who were paid. I, I went through the mm -hmm. list of employees. No. No, I don't know. I, this is purely volunteer. I, um, I haven't really been able to contribute much because I've been so busy with work and I'm working on some other projects. Um, so yeah, I've just, it's hard for me to contribute, you know, to this, to this, but I'm glad that I could be here today and host for Ray, uh, big shoes to fill because Ray's, you know, really in the space and he's a great, a great host. So yeah, I'm just trying to keep things up while he's away. Yeah, maybe we could have more meetings. We had one meeting on um, just developing a, a letter of intent, and it was, mm -hmm. it was it was better attended than any of the other meetings. It's like people Interesting. Really want, people, it seems like people really want to um, get funding for Hyperledger because they believe in it and they think it's fun. It's a fun way to interact. It's like a, it's like a a collabathon, a never ending collabathon, you know. Mm -hmm. And and yet. Uh, how many people are really is is there a funding is there a funding sig special interest group <laughs> where they actually just work on getting funding all the time that would be that'd be good wouldn't it i think so there's a there's a lot of fun there's a lot of um of money out there especially right now people focusing on fintech health tech climate tech all of all of mm -hmm. the and and the blockchain uh technology is is rising it's about five percent of the total assets of the alumni ventures um association so it's yeah, really I've, rising yeah i've noticed a lot of like activity and grants and stuff in the DAOs that i'm into so so maybe one of these days we'll have it uh or maybe we could turn the the payer subgroup the hyperledger healthcare special interest group payer subgroup into a, a fundraising kind of where mm. we actually work on that I, i'd like to do that yeah, I know Thomas was asking, like, I don't even think those subgroups are active and there's still meetings, but I don't think anyone hosts them. So we're trying no, to figure I go, that out. I go to all of them. Oh, you do? Okay, I, great. Denise goes to every, uh, every other one. He goes to all of the patient subgroup meetings. Does he? Oh, I and remember so, when he was host. So okay, so yeah. So they are they are active, but they're not very active. It's mm -hmm. lucky, lucky we get four people to show up. Yeah, okay. Okay. And that'll change in the future. Thank you very much for hosting. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys for coming. And I'm glad we had at least one other person here earlier that um, contributed and, and introduced themselves. So that was great. Um, any final comments before we close the meeting? All right. Well, everyone have a great day and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.